So there was this time when my dad and I made this journey, and I didn't realize it at the time, but it was really kind of an epic journey, sort of one of these once-in-the-lifetime things. And we, we flew down to Paraguay and spent some time there um, with some relatives that we have in the Mennonite colonies in Paraguay. And then, um, for some reason, we had this idea that we would take buses, and we did this. We took buses from Asuncion and went down into um, Argentina, and then we went across to Chile, and then we went up into Peru. And it was this, you know, it took a week to do this, right? This, these long trips, these massive expanses by bus. It was this epic journey. And I remember we were in, in Buenos Aires, which is a huge city, a city I didn't know a thing about. We had just been there a couple of days, kind of bumping around and exploring a little bit. And it was time for us to take the bus to, to go on to the next stop. And as we, we got on this bus, right, and it's, going, it's, it's working its way through traffic and kind of weaving in and out of the cars of this huge city that I didn't really know, for some reason the idea just kind of got into my head that we were going the wrong way. Now, I didn't, I didn't know this city, right? And I honestly, I, couldn't, I didn't have a compass or something. I couldn't tell which way we had to be going. But I was just sure that we need to be going, you know, west, which was over there. I was sure. And we were going east. And, and it wouldn't get out of my head. And so I, I stood up and kind of like bobbed my way to the front of the bus. And the, the driver's, you know, working his way through huge city traffic. And I say, um, excuse me, senor, um, don't we need to be going, don't we need to be going that way? And he just kind of drives for a little bit and he goes, young man, sit down. I'm driving this bus. <laughs> and believe it or not, he did know where we were going. So we're in this series, five big questions. And we're asking these human questions, these questions that I think a lot of us carry around inside of us. And the question today is, where is the world headed? I mean, where is the world headed anyway? Is it just, is it just chaos out there? Is the, are the marbles rolling all over the board? Um, are we going any direction? The question is, who is driving the bus, if anybody? And one of the things that we see again and again when we look at the scriptures is that the world was just as chaotic back then in the times of the Bible as it is now, probably more so. Maybe we know more about stuff that's going on in, in distant parts of the world than people did then, but however things, crazy things seemed, out of that background noise of the world's chaos, there was something else that God's people could always discern, and that was this, that God was at work, that God had not abandoned the world, that despite what looks like a free-for-all, God is guiding the world to his own good end. Now, the nightly news, then as now, may make you think otherwise, but God is, in fact, driving the bus. Now, we're looking at the letter of Hebrews this morning, and nobody knows who wrote this letter. It's a very powerful piece of scripture that speaks of hope, speaks of salvation, speaks about the Sabbath, speaks about Jesus' identity as the eternal Son of God. And what Hebrews likes to do is frame everything in terms of worship in the temple. So Jesus is a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, this mysterious priest-king figure that Abraham met back in the book of Genesis, or the sacrifice that Jesus offers. He's, he's the priest. He's also the sacrifice. And um, heaven is like this tabernacle or this temple where the people of Israel worshiped. And um, Jesus is entering into this inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, to intercede on behalf of his people. And a big part of the message of Hebrews is that, is that in all of the Old Testament, its sacrifices, its rituals, they point to Christ who fulfills them. And this chapter of Hebrews is talking about God's promises. So if you've got your, your Bibles open, verse, verse 12, which was not one we read, but verse 12, it says um, that we want people to, be, uh, who st to step out in faith. We want to be those kind of people who can step out of faith, in faith, inherit the promise that God has for us. And the promise that Hebrews talks about is the one that God made to Abraham back in Genesis. So um, verse 14 it says, this is God speaking, I will surely bless you, that's Abraham, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. It's the, the promise to bless Abraham and give him many descendants. Now God first promised Abraham this back in Genesis 12, and he says that he will bless Abraham, make his name great, make him a great nation. And then in Genesis 22, God affirms that blessing with an oath. And God says that he will bless Abraham and make Abraham's offspring more numerous 
than the stars of heaven and the sand of the seashore. And this promise that is affirmed with an oath, right? Promise and oath. It's about as strong as you can get in the scriptures, right? God's word is always true. God cannot lie. God cannot be proven false. So if God says it, it's a promise. But in this case, God doubly promises, right? It's a promise with an oath. And so Abraham and all his descendants can be doubly confident. And it's just like when people are, are, are sworn into office, right? Maybe um, for a political office, you know, local or national, right? A lot of times they'll put their hand on a Bible and they'll say, so help me God. Except that here in God's case, there is no one higher by whom God can swear. It's, you know, God has no one who is a greater reality than himself. So God swears by himself. So help me myself. And, and God will keep his promise because he is God, the one who is trustworthy and true, and his character is unshakable. His word never fails. His mercies never come to an end. And that promise that God gave Abraham, that he would bless him, that he'd make him a great nation, the promise is still true. It's channeled through Jesus. It's opened up in him so that anyone who believes in and follows Jesus has access to that promise. And this is really key. God promises that he will bless Abraham that he will make Abraham a great nation. And we get that first part, I think, right? It's a blessing. And a blessing is something good. To bless is to say a good word over someone or something. That's literally what it means, this good word, to bless. It is to intend goodness. I mean, we, we want that, right? We want that goodness. We all want to receive a blessing. I mean, don't we, right? Who wants a blessing? Um, and, and we want something good to come into our lives. And God is saying to Abraham, I promise you that I am leading you towards something good. And a blessing is what God intends for us in Jesus Christ. It still, still stands. And that second part, where, that God says he will make Abraham a great nation, that he will have many descendants, that requires us to think a little bit. Now, it's more than just having lots of kids. It's, I mean, that is pretty much what Abraham thought when he heard it, that he'd have this very big family. A lot of times... Today, we're not so sure about a big family, um, but in the Old Testament, a big family was an unequivocal good. So Psalm 127, happy is the man whose quiver is full of sons. It's, it's like the, the blessing and the command that God gave at the beginning of Genesis, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So children then and now are a gift from God. Not everyone has the same experience. Not everyone has given children into, into their lives. And God's not saying that the promise is only for or to those who have children. It goes deeper than that. You see, God always had in mind more than just giving Abraham many biological children. And in one way that did happen, Abraham had many physical descendants. But in another way, in a more important way, God made Abraham's descendants like the sand of the seashore and the stars of the sky because God adopted them into the covenant and God adopted in all who believe in Jesus. This is Galatians 3, 9. Those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believes. We're, we're all children of the promise that God made to Abraham. It's not just about biological children. And here's the thing. What God was telling Abraham when he promised him many descendants was not just about quantity, that there would be a lot of them. It was also about who those descendants would be. They would be God's people. God was promising Abraham a people. God was promising Abraham and his descendants an identity as the people of God. It was both a blessing and an identity. And those promises hold true. God promises us a blessing and identity. And, and I think this is really key if we want to understand where the world is headed. <clears throat> Here's the thing. The world is headed somewhere. And we might think the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but the world is going somewhere. Now, that wouldn't necessarily have to be the case. In some cultures, the world is understood as being more static or as being circular, that ages past return again to ages present. The, the ancient Greek world was something kind of like that, where um, uh, history kind of has a, a rhyming, repetitive quality to itself. It, it repeats. But the, the biblical worldview is different. In the biblical worldview, the world is heading toward an end, toward a goal. And the vision that we see in the scriptures is that God is drawing the world to his own end, to his goal. The, 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 it's, it's a good end. And I, I think a lot of people in our society 
even if you take the scriptures and God out of the picture, many people still have the idea that the world is going somewhere and they, they think it's probably good. You know, many people, I think, have an idea of utopia, right? Utopia as this, this perfect place, a place where all is well, a place where human beings can flourish, can live fully and truly. We can become who we were born to be. I heard someone say that we are all functional utopians, which means that we're all walking around with a utopian vision in our minds of where we think the world is going, what would be the perfect vision of what the world ought to be like. You know, maybe we think that if we can just get our technology right, then we'll be living in that better world. Or if we can, you know, we'll be able to control pollution and clean plastic out of the ocean and cure cancer and go farther on a tank of gas. We'll be able to arrive at that, that vision of a better world. And th those are all good things. Or maybe we'll become more just, more compassionate. That's all, that's all good. As human beings, we, we have grown in what we can do with our minds. And in some ways, we've grown in what we understand in our hearts as well. I think um, on my good days, I resonate with that idea that we are building a better world, a more peaceful, verdant world. Um, and there are ways that, that, that the world has improved for many people. You know, indoor plumbing. But the vision, <laughs> the vision of the scriptures encompasses something more than that movement towards technology. It's something that's moving towards goodness, and it's bigger than that. It's a vision of blessing, and it's, it's, it's a vision of, of moving towards God. It's something cosmic. So evil will be defeated. And it won't be just that we're, we're, we can treat diseases better, but that disease will vanish from human experience. It's not that we'll be better at stopping war, but there won't be war. It's the vision of the book of Revelation. The lamb wins. And that's what is ultimately in mind here when God blesses Abraham and, and through Christ blesses all of his people in the world. That's ultimately what's in mind, that God is drawing the whole of history to his good end. Now that process has a long tail. And it happens in fits and starts, one step forward, two steps back. And in the end, God's blessing goes beyond whatever vision we have of human history and into the world to come. But the blessing is unstoppable. God will accomplish his vision. His vision of blessing is wrapped up with the vision of peoplehood. God promised many descendants to Abraham, and they, there would be descendants. Um, who, they, they're they're going to be these people who love and, and serve and follow God, the people of Israel who God set about forming and preserving and defending and disciplining. Um, they're, they're people that God has worked with across history. They're all who follow Christ, this enormous chosen people that we call the church who have this distinctive identity as God's people. They're set apart, not like the rest of the world. They, they march to a different drummer, or at least that's the idea. This is why Peter talks about the church as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. This is why Paul speaks of, uh, of God's people who are chosen people, holy and beloved. We have an identity as a people who have been saved by grace, uh, bought by the price of Jesus' blood, washed in the water of baptism, shaped by the scriptures, fed at his table, beloved of God. This is the central goal of God's project across history, the formation of a people who are in communion with him. That's why the world was created, why Abraham was called, why Moses was given the law. It's the reason for the kings and the prophets and the poets. It's why Jesus came and he lived and he died and was raised. It was all to form this holy people, this set-apart people who are chosen and beloved, who choose and love God in return. It's a people whose lives are shaped by Christ. And so the vision of God's blessing and the vision of this people who find their identity in God, they're, they're tied together. One flows into, the, into another. Where's the world headed? Toward the good blessing of being God's people. Or at least that's the calling. That's the possibility. There are other visions out there, and they, they don't all include God. In fact, some of them are exclusive of God, and God never forces anyone to enter into that blessing and vision. But ultimately, all the other isms that try to order human life will swell and pop and pass away, and it will be the lamb on the mountaintop surrounded by myriads upon myriads. It will be Zion coming down out of heaven. It will be God with his people forever. Whatever happens, Jesus is driving the bus, and that's where we're headed. 
And I think this is why verse 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. The, her, the hope is, first off, Jesus, but in particular, Jesus, who will bring blessing and people to fruition. You see, hope is always hope in something. In our contemporary culture, hope means sort of this, this vague optimism. I hope things turn out okay. I, I hope we don't get three inches of snow in October. Um, I hope you like this sermon. <laughs> but for Christians... Hope is always rooted in Jesus. It's trusting that he will bring his blessing and his people to completion no matter what obstacles stand in the way. It's trusting that he is truly good and that the vision he has shared with us is the only lasting path to happiness. It's trust that Jesus really is at work in the world and in our lives no matter what happens. He's guaranteed the future. And I think that when we have this hope that Jesus has guaranteed the future, it lets us live in a different way in the present. There's, there's something about hope for the future that gives us hope for the day to day. And I, you know, I love the image here in the chapter that we're reading in, in Hebrews, right? That Jesus is the anchor of our souls. We are held firm in him. We are kept safe in him. There is no storm that can come and destroy us if we are holding fast to the anchor. And Jesus says in the Gospel of John that the Father has given him a people. And he says, no one will ever snatch them out of my hands. And I believe that. And you know, we're, we're asking the big question about where the world is headed. It's really a hope question. The question really is, is there hope for the world? But take it down a step, right? It, it's, there's a personal dimension. You see, in Christ, that promise of blessing and identity that God made to Abraham, that promise applies to each of us personally. God promises to bless us. God promises an identity. Have you ever needed a blessing? I, I know I have. There have been times in my life when I have really needed something from God, some word, some outcome, some sign that he is there and at work, some open door. And honestly, there have been so many times when God has shown up and he has blessed me way more than I deserve. I mean, there have been hard things. There have been anxious, nail-biting, stressful things, but there have also been tons of blessings. And I, and I don't say that flippantly. You know, we can sometimes be a little glib with the way that we throw that word blessing around. I mean, everything that's kind of pleasant and goes our way is a blessing. But I have been blessed, and I bet you have too. And often it's not what I want, though it's always been what I need, Often it's unexpected and it can feel like the manna from heaven that fed those ancient Israelites in the desert, just, just enough for today, my daily bread. You know, it's the harder blessings that are the most interesting. Um, the other day I was grabbing a few things at the grocery store and someone um, says to me, Brad, you're always in a hurry, which seemed kind of random. In fact, I was there with my son. He said, why'd she say that to you? And I didn't know. I kind of just shrugged and, you know, hurried on my way. But <laughs> I realized the next day that I was hurrying through Scripture, and I was hurrying through prayer, that I was in a hurry, and I felt, in that moment, I felt convicted. I felt like God had really just spoken something into my life. It was almost audible. Slow down. Be present. Brad, you're always in a hurry. And there it was, that, that conscience-pricking blessing that I needed right then and there. You know, part of having Jesus as the anchor of our souls is to say that he has blessed us, that he will bless us. And so we have a certain kind of optimism. And it's, you know, it's so easy to knock optimists, to, to kind of be cynical, to be jaded. Um, you know, it's easy to knock optimists. I remember there was this, this building near, near where one of my friends lived, and it said on the, I'd see it when I'd drive to my friend's house in high school, I saw it, it said, the Optimists Club. And I, I guess Optimist Club is this, this national organization that works with youth. I honestly don't know much about them. But I always saw that and was like, wow, you know, that's, do, do you have to be an optimist to get in the club, or do you become an optimist when you join, right? I didn't know what it was, and I was just thinking, you know, here it is, the Optimist Club. But I like, like that idea of just naming, right in the identity, optimism. You know, the church ought to be a little bit like that. Maybe not so clubby, but optimists. Optimists about the future. 
optimists about God's blessing and faithfulness. I think that if we believe Jesus is for real, then we should have that kind of optimism about our lives. And here's the thing. Not everything will go as planned. Trust me, that, that, that is not how it goes. It won't be a fairy tale. But we believe that Jesus has blessed us, that Jesus is blessing us, that Jesus will be faithful to bless us in the future, and there will be goodness that will come our way. Whether or not we acknowledge that goodness is from him is another matter entirely, but we are and will be a blessed people. What would you write down if I were to ask you to name your blessings? What would be your blessings? And what would you imagine that Jesus is blessing you with in the future? You know, part of the way that Jesus gives us hope for the future is through that blessing, but it's also through this idea of an identity. The two are intertwined. I mean, there's this deep human longing for an identity. And I think all of us want to know who we are, where we've come from, where we're going to be. And they say that one of the attractions of gang life in depressed areas of the world is that sense of identity and that togetherness that comes from being part of the gang. You want to be part of something that's larger than yourself. You know, the, these folks here, they've, they've got my back. And I think this is why accompaniment is so powerful. This is why Paul writes in Romans that we're to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're to mourn with those who mourn. It's why Paul writes that we are one body with many members We accompany one another in the places of sickness and loss. We bear each other's burdens. And this is so vital. I just just participated in a seminar in which the speaker talked about ways that, that people who have been through trauma, they can experience healing. And he said that, and this is something measurable, he talked about the importance of a community of care and said that high support and hope helps people find healing, both physical and emotional. Now, I was talking to someone recently in a small-town Mennonite church. He's a 70-year-old man, and he described how his pastor asked him to go and pick up these teenage brothers and drive them to youth group. He kind of lived out by that family. Church was far away. He said, can you go pick them up? And this this drive of these teenage brothers to youth group kind of morphed into a friendship that included him teaching these youth how to drive so they could get their driver's license. He said, we had a, a few close calls, but it's all good. He said they they would drive around in the country, right? Sometimes them driving, sometimes him. And they'd drive around in the country, and then they'd end up in a small town, go get something to eat at a fast food restaurant, and they'd just sit there and talk. And he told me that at the beginning, he he had really thought about these boys as his project. And he wanted to guide them and help them. He wanted to fix their lives. Um, He didn't want them to make the same poor decisions that their parents had made. He wanted them to have a, a better life. But it wasn't working. And at some point, he started just to see them as friends. And he said, honestly, it seems kind of crazy that this, these kids even liked me. But it doesn't seem crazy to me. There he was. He cared for them. He was there for them. He listened to them. He's been accompanying them in this chapter of their lives. And they can sense the profound goodness of that. And it doesn't matter that they're 15, 16, 17, and he's 17. He's with them. And one way I look at what he has been doing is that he has affirmed their identity as people who are beloved and who are worthy of his time and affection. You know, identity is about belonging. And we all want to belong somewhere. We all want to belong to someone. And I think part of the good news of Jesus and the reason that we have hope is because we have an identity in him. Whatever we've been through, whatever we've done, we are all called to find our deepest identity in Jesus, that the waters of baptism are open to anyone. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, whether the world or life or death or the present or the future, he said, all belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. This is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us, that we could be called as children. Who are you? You're a child of God. Who are you? you? You are the one that come what may is beloved by God. You have an identity in Christ. You belong to him. No matter what happens, no matter what others think of you, no matter how successful or apparently unsuccessful you are, that identity endures forever. You belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Brothers and sisters, where's the world headed? We don't know the details 
We don't know what will come tomorrow, but we do know a couple of things, and this is what matters. The first is that you have been blessed, and you will be blessed. And the second is that you have an identity in him. Jesus is our hope, the anchor of our souls. No matter what happens, he's the one driving the bus. Thanks be to God. Amen.